Oblomov by Ivan Goncharov Chapter 5 Continued After dinner, the child accompanied his nurse for a second airing out of doors. Yet, despite her mistress's injunctions and her own resolves, the old woman could not altogether resist the general call of sleep and began to fall a victim to the all-prevalent malady of Oblomovka. At first she kept a vigilant eye upon her little charge, and, chiding him for his waywardness, never let him stray from her side. But presently, after giving him strict instructions not to go beyond the gates, nor to interfere with the goat, nor to climb either the dovecote or the gallery, she settled herself in a shady spot, with the ostensible intention of at once knitting a stocking and of watching over young Oblomov. Next she took to checking him only in lazy fashions, as her head nodded, and she said to herself, Look, you, he will certainly climb those stairs to the gallery, or else, her eyes had almost closed, he will run down into the ravine. With that her head sank forward, and the stocking slipped from her hands. In a second her open mouth had emitted a gentle snore, and the boy had disappeared from her vision. Needless to say, this was the moment which the youngster had been impatiently awaiting, for it marked the beginning of an independent existence, and he was now alone in the wide, wide world. On tiptoe he left his nurse's side, and, peeping cautiously at the other slumberers, kept stopping to throw a second glance at anyone who chanced to stir, or to spit, or to snuffle in his sleep. At last, with a tremor of joy in his heart, he made for the gallery, ascended the creaking stairs at a run, scaled also the dovecote, explored the recesses of the garden, listened to the buzzing of beetles, and followed with his eyes their flight through the air. Next, on hearing a chirping sound in the grass, he sought and captured the disturber of the public peace in the shape of a dragonfly, whose wings he proceeded to tear off, and whose body to impale upon a straw, in order that he might see how, thus hampered, the creature would contrive to fly. Afterwards, fearing almost to breathe, he watched a spider suck blood from a captured fly, while the wretched victim struggled and buzzed in the spider's claws. Finally, the tragedy was brought to an end by the boy slaying both torturer and tortured. Next, he repaired to the moat to search for sundry small roots which he knew of, which found, he peeled them, and then devoured the same with relish, in the make-believe that they were the apples and preserves which his mamma was accustomed to giving him. This item exhausted, he hied him through the entrance gates, his object in so doing being to reach a birch copse which looked to him so close at hand that, should he take the direct route, and not the circuitous high road, that is to say, should he walk straight across the moat and through the osier plantation, he would be able to attain his goal in five minutes. But, alas, he felt afraid, for he had heard tales of wood goblins, of brigands, and of fearsome wild beasts. Next, the spirit moved him to make for the ravine, which lay a hundred paces from the garden. So, running to the edge of the declivity, and puckering his eyes, he gazed into its depths as into Vulcan's crater. Suddenly to his mind recurred all the tales and traditions concerning the spot, and terror seized him, and half dead, half alive, he rushed back and threw himself into his nurse's arms. Awakened, she sprang up, straightened the cap on her head, arranged her gray curls with one finger, and pretended never to have been to sleep at all. Glancing suspiciously at the little Ilya, and then at the gentry's windows, she began with tremulous hands to work the knitting needles of the stockings which had been lying in her lap. Meanwhile, the heat had decreased, and everything in nature had revived a little, since the sun was fast declining towards the forest. Gradually, the stillness indoors also began to be broken. Here and there, a door creaked, footsteps could be heard crossing the yard, and someone sneezed in the hayloft. Soon, from the kitchen, a man came hurrying under the weight of a huge samovar, and the entire household then assembled for tea. One man with his face flushed and his eyes still dim, another man with red marks on his cheeks and temple. 
a third speaking in a voice not his own for drowsiness, and all of them snuffling, wheezing, yawning, scratching their heads, and stretching themselves in a semi-waking condition. It seemed that dinner and sleep had combined to arouse an unquenchable thirst which parched the throat, for even dozens of cupfuls of tea could not assuage it, and, amid a chorus of sighs and grunts, resort had to be made to bilberry wine, to perry, to kvass, and even to more medicinal methods of moistening this avidity of gullet. The company sought relief from thirst as from a heaven-sent plague, and all felt as exhausted as though they were traveling in the Arabian desert and could nowhere find a spring. By his mother's side, the child gazed at the strange faces around him and listened to the drowsy, drolling talk. Yet the spectacle delighted him, and he found each stray word interesting. After tea, everyone took up some minor occupation or another. One man repaired to the riverside and strolled along the brink, kicking pebbles into the water as he did so. Another took a seat in a window and followed with his eyes each passing occurrence. Should a cat cross the courtyard or a jackdaw fly by, the watcher scanned both the one and the other and turned his head to right and to left in order to do so. In the same way will dogs spend whole days at a window, their heads thrust into the sunlight, and their gaze taking stock of every passerby. The mother took little Ilya's head in her hands, drew it down into her lap, and combed his hair with a gentle caress as, inviting her maids to admire him, she talked concerning his future and preordained for him the hero's part in some splendid epic. For their part, the maids foretold for him mountains of gold. At length, dusk began to draw in. Once more, the fire crackled in the kitchen, and the clatter of knives became audible. Supper was being prepared. Meanwhile, the rest of the servants gathered at the entrance gates, and thence came sounds of laughter, and of music, and of the playing of Gorielki. The sun had sunk behind the forest, yet still was sending forth rays in a fiery, faintly warm streak which, as it passed over the surface of the treetops, touched to gold the tips of the pines. Finally, these rays successively expired, until only a solitary beam could be seen fixed, needle-like, in a cluster of boughs before going to join its comrades. Objects then began to lose their outline, and the scene to become blurred in first grayness, then a blank almost of total obscurity. The songs of birds grew fainter, then ceased altogether, save for one persistent singer which, as though disagreeing with its fellows, continued to break the silence with intermittent warbling. Presently it too took to uttering its song at rarer intervals, and to whistling with more feeble insistence, until finally it breathed a last soft-drawn note, gave a flutter or two which gently stirred the foliage around it, and fell asleep. After that, all was silent, save that some crickets were chirping in chorus and against one another. A mist was rising from the earth and spreading over lake and river. Like everything else, the latter had sunk to rest, and though something caused it to splash for a last time, the water instantly resumed its absolute immobility. In the air, a dampness could be detected, and the air itself could be felt growing warmer and warmer. Amid it, the trees looked like groups of monsters, and when, suddenly, something cracked in the weird depths of the forest, it might have been thought that one of those monsters had been shifting its position, and with its foot it snapped a dry bough in doing so. Overhead, the first star could be seen glowing like a living eye, while in the windows of the house were a few twinkling lights. The hour of nature's most solemn, all-embracing silence had arrived, the hour when the creative brain can work at its best, and when poetic thought seethes most ardently, and when the heart flames with the greatest heat of passion or with the greatest poignancy of grief. 
the hour when the cruel soul ripens to a maximum of strength and composure as it meditates evil, the hour when, at Oblomovka, everyone settled down to a night of profound, calm restfulness. Let us go for a walk, said little Ilya to his mother. God bless the child, she cried. How could we go for a walk? It is now damp and you would get your little feet wet. Besides, we should find it dreadful out of doors, for at this hour the wood goblin is abroad, and he carries off little boys. To what place does he carry them, and what is he like, and where does he live? asked the child, whereupon the mother gave full rein to her unbridled fancy. As she did so, the child listened with blinking eyes until at length, on sleep completely overcoming him, the nurse approached took him from his mother's lap and bore him to bed with his head hanging over her shoulder. Another day is over, praise be to God, said the inmates of Oblomovka, as, yawning, they made the sign of the cross and then retired to rest. Well spent it has been, and God send that tomorrow be like it. Glory, O Lord, to thee this night. Glory, O Lord, to thee. Oblomov dreamed a second dream. On a long winter's evening, he was pressing close to his nurse, and she was whispering of some unknown country where neither cold nor darkness were known, and where miracles took place, and where rivers ran honey and milk, and where no one did anything the year round, and where only good boys, like Ilya Ilyich himself, walked day by day in company with maidens such as neither tongue nor pen could hope to describe. Also, the nurse said, there dwelt there a kind witch who sometimes revealed herself to mortals in the shape of a pikefish, and this witch singled out as her especial favorite a quiet, inoffensive boar who formerly had been the butt of his fellows, and, for some unknown reason, heaped him with her bounty, so that always he possessed plenty to eat, and clothes ever ready to wear, and ended by marrying a marvelous beauty whose name was Militrissa Kerbetademna. The nurse related the story, and the child with alert eyes and ears hung upon her words. So artfully did the nurse or tradition eliminate from the story all resemblance to everyday life that the boy's keen intellect and imagination, fired by the device, remained enthralled until, in later years, he had come even to man's estate. As a matter of fact, the tale which the nurse thus lovingly related was the legend of the fool Emil, that clever, biting satire upon our forefathers and, it may be, also upon ourselves. True, in proportion as he grew up, little Oblomov came to learn that no such things as rivers of honey and milk, or even such persons as kind witches, really existed. Yet, though he came to smile at his nurse's stories, that smile was never wholly sincere, since always it would be accompanied by a sigh. For him, the legend confounded itself with life, and, unconsciously, he found himself regretting that the legend differed from life, and that life differed from the legend. Involuntarily, he would dream of Militrissa Kerbatinevna, and feel attracted towards the country whereof nothing was known except that folk there went for walks, and were free from sorrow and care. Never could he rid himself of a longing to spend his days in lying upon the stove, even as the favorite of the legend had done, and to be dressed in ready-made, unearned clothes, and to eat to the expense of a benevolent witch. To the same story had his father and his grandfather listened as, shaped according to the stereotyped version current throughout antiquity, it had issued from the mouths of male and female nurses through the long course of ages and of generations. Then Oblomov's nurse proceeded to draw another picture for the imagination of her charge. That is to say, she told him of the exploits of the Russian Achilleses and Ulysseses, and of the manner in which these heroes had been used to wander about Russia, and to kill and slay, 
and of how once they had disputed as to which of them could best drain a beaker of wine at a draught. Also, she told the boy of cruel robbers, of sleeping princesses, and of cities and peoples which had been turned into stone. Lastly, she passed to Russian demonology, to dead folk, to monsters, and to werewolves. With a simplicity, yet a sincerity, worthy of Homer, with a lifelike similitude of detail and a power of clear-cut relief that might have vied with the great Greek poets, she fired the boy's intellect and imagination to a love for that Iliad which our heroes founded during the dim ages when man had not yet become adapted to the sundry perils and mysteries of nature and of life, when still he trembled before werewolves and wood demons and sought refuge with protectors like Alicia Popovich from the calamities which surrounded him, when air and water and forest and field alike were under the continued sway of the supernatural. Truly the life of a mortal of those days must have been full of fear and trembling, seeing that, should he but cross his threshold, he stood in danger of being devoured by a wild beast, or of having his throat cut by a brigand, or of being despoiled of his all by a tartar, or of disappearing from human ken without trace left. Again, celestial portents would be seen in the shape of pillars and balls of fire, while over a freshly made grave a light would glow, and someone would seem to be walking through the forest with a lantern, and laughing horribly, and flashing bright eyes amid the gloom. And in man's own personality, much that passed as understanding would also take shape and materialize. No matter how long or how righteously a man might have lived, he would suddenly start babbling, or shout aloud in a voice not his own, or go wandering a nights in a trance, or involuntarily begin beating and assaulting his fellows. And just at the moment when such things happened, a hen would crow like a cock, and a raven would croak from the gable. Consequently, feeble mankind, peering tremblingly at life, sought in its own imagination, its own nature, a key to the mysteries which surrounded it. And it may be that the immobility, the inertia, the absence of all active passion or incident or peril which such a retired existence imposed upon man led him to create, in the midst of the world of nature, another and an impossible world, in which he found comfort and relief for his idle intellect, explanations of the more ordinary sequences of events, and extraneous solutions of extraordinary phenomena. In fact, our poor forefathers lived by instinct, neither wholly giving rein to nor wholly restraining their volition, they found themselves either naively surprised at or overcome with terror by the evils and the misfortunes which befell them, and resorted for the causes of these things to the dim, dumb hieroglyphics of nature. In their opinion, death might come of carrying a corpse from a house head foremost instead of with feet in front, and a fire be caused by the fact of a dog having howled three nights running beneath a window. Hence always they were at pains to remove a dead person feet foremost, though continuing to eat the same quantity of food as before, and to sleep on the bare ground, while, with regard to a howling dog, always they drove away the animal with blows, though continuing to scatter sparks broadcast over tinder-dry floors. To this day the Russian, though surrounded by a stern, unimaginative world of reality, loves to believe the seductive tales of antiquity, and long will it be before he will have been weaned from that belief. In the same way, as little Oblomov listened to his nurse's legends concerning the golden fleece, the great cassowary bird, and the cells and secret dungeons of the enchanted castle, he became more and more fired to the idea that he, too, was destined to become the hero of doughty deeds. Tales succeeded to tale, and the nurse pursued her narrative with such ardor and vividness and attractiveness of description that at times her breath choked in her throat. For she, too, half believed the legends which she related, 
so that, during the telling of them, her eyes would shoot fire, her head shake with excitement, and her voice attain an unwanted pitch, while the child, overcome with mysterious horror, would press closer and closer to her side and have tears in his eyes. Whether the narrative treated of dead men rising from the tomb at midnight or of victims languishing in slavery to a monster, or of a bear with a wooden leg which went roaming the villages and farms in search of the natural limb which had been chopped from its body. The boy's hair bristled with fear. His childish imagination alternately seethed and froze, and he experienced the harassing, the sickly sweet process of having his nerves played upon like the strings of an instrument. When his nurse repeated the words of the bear, Creak, creak, wooden leg, I have visited every village and farm, and have found all the women asleep save one, who is now sitting on my back, and searing my flesh, and weaving my coat into cloth. When, also, the bear entered the right hut, and was just getting ready to pounce upon the true ravisher of his natural leg, why, then the boy could stand it no longer, but, trembling and whimpering, flung himself into his nurse's arms with tears of terror, yet also with a laugh of joy to think that he was not in the clutches of the bear, but sitting on the stove couch beside the old guardian. Full of strange phantoms was his mind, and fear and grief had sunk deep and, possibly forever, into his soul. Mournfully he gazed about him, and saw that everything in life was charged with evil and misfortune. And as he did so, he would keep thinking of the magic country, where neither cruelty nor noise nor grief existed, and where Militrissa Kurbatinevna lived, and where folk were fed and clothed for nothing. Not only over the Oblomovka children, but also over the Oblomovkan adults, did this legend exercise a lifelong sway. Everyone in the house and the village alike, from the baron and his wife down to the blacksmith Taras, became a trifle nervous as evening drew on, seeing that at that hour every tree became transformed into a giant, and every bush into a robber's den. The rattle of a shutter, the howl of the wind in the chimney, caused these folk to turn pale. At epiphany tide, not a man or a woman of them would go out of doors after ten o'clock at night, and never during the season of Easter would anyone venture a night's into the stable, lest there he should be confronted by the Delmavoy, by the horse demon. At Oblomovka, everything was believed in, including even ghosts and werewolves. Had you informed an inmate of the place that a haycock was walking about in the fields, he would have believed it. Had you spread abroad a rumor that, say, a certain sheep was not a sheep at all, but something else, or that Martha, or that Stepanida, had become turned into a witch, the company would thenceforth have walked in terror both of the sheep and of the maidservant. Never would their heads have thought it necessary to inquire why the sheep had ceased to be a sheep, or why Martha or Stepanida had become turned into a witch. Rather, these credulous folk would have thrown themselves upon any doubter, so strong was Oblomovka's belief in supernatural phenomena. Later, little Oblomov came to see that the world is ordered on a simple plan, and that dead folk never rise from the tomb, and that no sooner do giants appear than they are clapped into booths, as robbers are cast into prison. Yet, though his actual belief in such marvels vanished, there remained behind a sediment of terror and of unaccountable sadness. Nothing was to be apprehended from monsters, that he knew full well. But always he stood in awe of something which seemed to be awaiting him at every step, and, if left alone in a dark room, or if fated to catch sight of a corpse, he would tremble with that sense of oppressive foreboding which his infancy had instilled into his very being. Inclined of a morning to laugh at his fears, of an evening his countenance paled again. <laughs> 